So, without further ado then, we're going to get started with our program. Uh, just one or two organizational points. Real quick, um, so each speaker, this morning we have two keynote speakers. They'll have around 20 minutes to talk. Then afterwards, in case they go a little bit longer, please don't be surprised. You might hear my voice just come in and say, please wrap it up, just so we keep our, our schedule. Then after that, we'll be doing a Q&A session, and we'll be using the Slido platform. I think many of you have used that before. Of course, you have the, the QR code here as well. Thank you very much for blending that in. And uh, yeah, without further ado, also it's fantastic in such a virtual event, we can literally beam from one part of the planet to the next. So if everything is working okay, let's see if we can join and say hello to our first speaker today. I'll look to the side here and see if he has a very complicated last name. I'm going to need your help. Ian Hirnazikiewicz. Am I saying that correct, Ian? And can you hear me first of all? I can hear you well. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear and see you very well. How do I pronounce your last name? Hirnazikiewicz. Hernaskievich. Am I close? <laughs> Not bad. Not Fant bad. Thank you very much. And welcome to the Open Science Conference. Before you begin your key keynote, um, I would like to uh, say a few words about your, your resume and also where are you coming in uh, today? Wh where are we beaming to? Uh, I am in Cambridgeshire in the UK. In beautiful Cambridge. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. And let me quickly introduce then Ian. Ian, uh, again, try to say it right. Hine Zevgivich is Director, Open Research Solutions at Public Library of Science, the PLOS, where he leads a program of activity that aims to increase adoption of open science practices and increase the benefits of adopting open sciences. This includes PLOS initiatives relating preprints, uh, pre open data and code, and open methods of protocols. Ian was previously head of data publishing at Springer Nature, where he developed and implemented research data poli policies and services, and was publisher of Nature Research Group's scientific data journal. He has also been the outreach director of Faculty of 1000 and spent seven years at the first commercial open access publisher, Biomed Central, in a variety of editorial publishing and product policy development roles. He has published numerous highly cited peer-reviewed papers and book chapters related to open science, data sharing, open access, and reproducible research. He's interested in efficiency and making the, quote, most of scientific data and papers and using the web to its full potential to make the most efficient use of the products of research, end quote. And today his keynote will be Open Science Indicators, a new tool to understand researchers and our, prog and our progress towards open science. So with that, I give the digital floor to Ian, I'll try it again, Hiran Zukovic. Thank you very much and, and thank you for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I'll uh, move straight on with my talk. I'm going to be telling you a, about a project, an initiative called Open Science Indicators. Um, I will firstly tell you briefly about PLOS Public Library of Science because it's quite a good segue in, into the rest of my talk. So nowadays I work at PLOS. Um, we're a nonprofit open access publisher empowering researchers to accelerate progress in research by leading a transformation in research communication. And what that really means is a transformation towards open science. Uh, PLOS was established in 2001 and was, was part of the early movement for open access to research results, research papers, so an important component of, 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 of the broad sort of definition of open science. Um, and a way of doing that was by providing viable alternatives to subscription journals. Uh, we publish 12 journals now and, and recently announced, very recently announced two new journals. Uh, but one of those journals is PLOS One, the first multidisciplinary publication that includes all research results, regardless of their novelty or impact. And, and PLOS is probably often best known for publishing that journal. But those journals are important vehicles for open science practices. They help to provide spaces for communities, research communities of open science practice to converge. They also show leadership in scholarly communication and in the research communities they serve or, or reflect the leadership of the research communities that they serve. They demonstrate the possibility of open science practice and they demonstrate the viability um, of more open approaches to research communication, such as 
demonstrating the importance of mandatory research data availability policies, which have been gaining more and more attention in the scholarly publishing industry in the last few years. Indeed, there are numerous milestones in how PLOS journals promote open science practices beyond the research results, beyond the paper. Um, a few examples here, the mandatory data sharing policy um, that included a requirement for statements of data availability in every article uh, was introduced by PLOS in 2014. Um, we've been early adopters of the ORCID and credit standards and been strong early supporters of preprint sharing, uh, in particular by partnering with community specific infrastructures and resources such as BioArchive, MedArchive and more recently Earth Archive. So beyond open access to research results, what does success look like? for open science? What are we trying to achieve by promoting open science practices? Now, we tend to assume that open science is ultimately about better science, science that is more rigorous, efficient, inclusive, and impactful for society. And a prerequisite to increasing these benefits of open science is increasing the prevalence of open science practices. So at PLOS, we've set ourselves the objectives of one, measurably increasing the adoption of open science practices, so we can two, better understand and enable those benefits of adopting open science practices. And one way uh, we're trying to achieve these objectives, um, in addition to our journal publishing program, is to operate an open research solutions program, um, whereby a solution, is anything that helps to achieve those objectives of increasing adoption of open science practice and increasing the benefits of that adoption. And a solution in this context can be anything within reason, could be a policy, a partnership, a technology, a workflow, incentives and rewards, training, or just or simply how we communicate with researchers. And um, so we have a program of, try, of, of understanding researchers and their needs, trying solutions and, um, and sharing what we find openly. But like most organizations, we can't do everything all at once. We've had to prioritize, and we have in the last two to three years, prioritized a subset of important open science practices beyond the article itself. We're currently focused on researching, testing and implementing solutions to increase adoption of four open science practices, sharing research data, sharing code, sharing reusable protocols and the early sharing of research through preprints. But with any objective we set ourselves, we have to be able to measure success and failure. Uh, and we have to do that in a way that's suitable and appropriate for our mission and values. But until recently, there was no easy way to measure these four open science practices, save from having an expert read every article, search for every, every research output. And we're not at PLOS the only ones who need better information on open science practices. We're not the only ones with this measurement problem. Um, this problem is shared by research funders, institutions, and policymakers, as demonstrated by qualitative research involving European funders, um, left hand side of the slide, who shared that lack of monitoring and reporting infrastructure is a preventative factor in monitoring open science policies. And also research we conducted at PLOS found that many research institutions and funders want to monitor open science practices, such as data and code sharing, but lack the ability to do this effectively and efficiently. So we set out to develop a new source of information um, initially and primarily to meet our own needs at PLOS. And so the Open Science Indicators Project was born about 18 months ago. In the near term, open science indicators help us to understand researchers, who are of course often our customers as a publisher. Um, we can understand what their sharing practices are and how these differ between groups. So this um, helps us co-create better solutions to support open science, open research practices in the context of that program of activity I was describing. But also 
if we share our methods, results, and data openly, we think we can also support efforts outside of PLOS, which can ultimately support furthering the adoption of open science globally. Before we started this project, we defined six guiding principles which help with decision making and our overall approach to this project. So firstly, first principle, uh, don't reinvent the wheel. We want to use and build upon the work of others in this initiative. Secondly, be pragmatic. Uh, we want to measure what's happening now. We want to look at what researchers are doing now, as well as being mindful of and trying to promote best practices or more aspirational practices. Third, we want to be interoperable across disciplines, across geographies, and across numerous publishers' content. Fourthly, we want to be scalable, and I mean across hundreds of thousands of published research papers. Fifth, perhaps an obvious one, but follow an open science approach ourselves by sharing data methods from this initiative. And finally, be responsible. Measure open science practices to support improvements and to increase understanding. Don't create rank, don't recreate rankings of journals, institutions, or individuals. You can read more about the Open Science Indicators project principles, the requirements we defined, and the measurement framework that we created before building the solution in the white paper cited on the slide. But I will emphasize um, that we are not the first to work on this measurement problem. And we need to partner with and be informed by the work of others to make progress. And much of our approach builds on or is informed by the work of meta researchers and tool developers and others who have been working in this space. Some important examples of the FAIR principles for how we defined our requirements, also been very much inspired by the work of organizations um, such as the Charité and their metrics da dashboard, and also um, a major piece of meta research that analyzed um, thousands and thousands of articles from PubMed Central by Sergio et al, um, cited in the bottom hand corner of the slide. But even more recently, there have been important national efforts such as the French Open Science Monitor and the UK Reproducibility Network, who have re respectively either created solutions or begun to explore requirements for monitoring open research practices to, to support, to suit their needs. Um, so after we defined our principles and requirements for open science indicators, we conducted a competitive request for proposals, or RFP for short, to identify a partner to help us deliver open science indicators. And so after that process, we selected Dataseer, um, which is a startup that uses natural language processing and artificial intelligence to detect open science behaviors in publications. So I'm going to move on to, to show you a bit more of what we've done and what we found. So in terms of what we've produced so far, um, so after releasing the first version of the Open Science Indicators data set in December, December 2022, yesterday, the 26th of June 2023, we released the third version of the data set, which now spans published content from the start of 2019 through to the end of March 2023. That includes more than 80,000 articles. Those are from PLOS journals, all articles published, all research articles published in PLOS journals, and a comparator cohort of non-PLOS journals. The comparators are randomly selected, but they're topic matched to the content published in PLOS journals, so we have a representative comparison. In the data set, there's metadata and other information that can be extracted directly from the articles themselves, but also that is supplemented by metadata that is created using the natural language processing and artificial intelligence approach combined with additional data processing, analyses, and quality control from the PLOS team. The data set includes rates of these open science practices. It includes the methods that for those open science practices, the topic areas, the geographic location, and even down to the individual persistent identifiers and repositories for specific research outputs. So, what are the results so far? Um, so this is all of the results or the entire data set in, in one summary graph, essentially. Um, so what we're measuring so far is three open science indicators, data sharing with a particular focus on use of repositories, secondly, code sharing, and thirdly, preprint posting. And we can observe um, that all these three indicators are steadily increasing and that these indicators tend to be higher in PLOS articles overall. 
The trend lines, the dotted lines, are more variable in the smaller comparator cohort, perhaps due to the smaller sample size, but we plan to expand that comparator cohort later this year in response to user feedback we've received on the data set. We're also actively developing the fourth indicator for protocol sharing, which will be available later in 2023, and we're also planning a fifth, uh, which is to be determined at this point. Um, so this graph is a very high level summary of the data set, but there are many, many ways you can explore the data set, which I'm going to show you a bit more of now. So looking at the example of data sharing, we measure this in multiple ways, shared in a repository, shared in other online locations, such as a lab website, and shared as supporting information. We can therefore, looking at all of those different methods of data sharing together, determine overall rates of data sharing, which uh, have reached around 75% in PLOS articles. So even at PLOS, we don't see 100% absolute compliance with our policies, but of course, uh, aspire to achieve that. Um, but importantly, there's a small proportion of papers that even at PLOS that we publish that don't share data publicly for legal or ethical reasons. And another consideration is that while this automated detection process for open science practices is has a high level of accuracy, more than 85%, um, it, it may miss some cases as well. And one key observation is that difference in data sharing rates between PLOS articles, the blue line, and the comparator articles. And it's highly likely that the reason for that is that all PLOS journals have a mandatory data sharing policy, and that is not going to be the case for all of the comparator journals. Another important feature of the open science indicators approach is that as well as detecting what outputs are shared, it also detects whether those outputs were even generated in the first place. So we can determine if data or code could be shared. Um, and this is especially revealing for code, as whether or not code was used or produced in a piece of research varies greatly by topic and discipline. So in computational biology, for example, code generation rates are close to 100% um, of papers that, that we publish, whereas for medicine, um, it's less than half. And this really helps us put sharing rates as a percentage of all articles in context. So indeed, on this graph, this is showing code sharing rates, um, taking into account those that actually generated code. And as such, those rates of code sharing are nearly double. Um, and this is really valuable. For, so we actually found out for the first time what proportion of PLOS articles, what proportion of articles actually have code that they could share, um, which really helps us understand different communities and helps us better um, determine which solutions might be suitable for different research communities. The data set provides article level data. And so we can drill down to the level of the individual paper and the individual research repository and the unique identifiers for data, for code, and for preprints. And another example of the use of the information is that we can use it to better understand sharing practices, such as the most commonly used repositories by researchers. And this, um, while this is simply a list of the most popular repositories in the data set overall, it can, of course, be further segmented to look at repositories used in particular topic areas, particular journals, particular regions, et cetera. As you can see here, general data repositories, Open Science Framework, Figshare, Zenodo, tend to be popular, well used among uh, researchers that publish with PLOS, but notably so is GitHub, um, which is obviously commonly and probably best known for code sharing, but appears to be commonly used for data sharing, which some might not view that as best practice. But as I set out in our principles, we're just we're really trying to understand what research is doing now. Final um, example, or one of my final examples, is that we can segment the data set by country and region. And we've observed, observed, for example, that sharing of preprints varies by more than 10 percentage points by region with Europe and the Americas being more likely to share preprints than other regions. And while we don't provide institution and funder information directly in the data set, it is possible to segment by institution and funder if article DOIs from a particular funder or the institution are known. And indeed, some funders and institutions have already done this using the data set um, for their own purposes to conduct more specific analysis. 
And this reuse of the data set is something that we really welcome and want to see um, in line with helping to support open science outside of PLOS. And here are two such examples of external reuse of open science indicators. On the left-hand side, earlier this year, the Bibliometrics and Indicators Manager at Imperial College London in the UK used the OSI data set, the Open Science Indicators data set, to analyze trends in open science practices for papers from that institution. They also emphasized in their blog post, which was very insightful, the need for responsible use of new metrics, and they're also highlighting potential limitations of their use in research assessment. Again, really in line with the principles we set out when we established this project. While we can't share names publicly, other institutions and funders have also contacted us personally about, about using or, or having used the data set. And we've also, even more recently, seen the data set has been considered, has been evaluated by researchers developing solutions for the ambitious French Open Science Monitor that I mentioned earlier which offers useful feedback, some of which is shown here on the coverage and the quality of, of the data, which is valuable for us as we develop open science indicators. So finally, what is next? Uh, I mean, given that many organizations seem to want better information on open science practices to support their open research goal, there is, I think, a real opportunity for cross-sector, cross-community collaboration here. Um, publishers, um, the industry that I work in, for example, have been working to promote data and preprint sharing in particular in recent years. And we can now finally better understand how effective these efforts actually have been. And I also think stimulate other in innovations um, that could promote open science and discovery of research. So we encourage other organizations to add to the data set. Um, it's open uh, if, they're, if they are measuring comparable indicators in comparable ways. And also we encourage anyone to provide us with feedback on the features they'd like to see in the data set, its scope, its coverage. Um, we continue to, to develop the data set. Um, we're extending the scope, and we're adding new measures of open science, protocol sharing I've mentioned. Uh, we're also going to be expanding it to include more non-PLOS content. Um, to make it more useful. That's actually been the most requested feature by users of the data set inside PLOS um, and also people outside of PLOS. Because really with, with better quantitative observational data about what open science practices we can actually see, I think if we that's, that's one source of information, but shouldn't of course be the only source of information, but if we can couple those powerful quantitative insights with growing body of qualitative research, whether that's from surveys, interviews, or, or other modes of assessment, I think there's a huge potential for a, for a more informed, more evidence-based understanding of our progress towards making open science practices the norm. But ultimately, uh, our choices at PLOS about how we develop open science indicators are going to be informed by your feedback. So if you have questions, suggestions, or need help using the data set, then simply drop me a line. And with that, I will say thank you for listening to my talk and happy to take questions. Super, thank you very much. Fascinating, fascinating presentation, and thank you very, very much. Yeah, so now, of course, we'd like to open it up for Q&A, for questions. Um, there's two ways right now to do that with the slider program. One, if we could maybe blend in underneath me, we will have a QR code. And with that QR code, you can go ahead with your phones and go ahead and enter that. That's possible if we can put that QR code there. The second way is also an email. Um, we've sent actually emails out to everyone to do that because the URL is having just a small glitch right now. Ah, and I see right now our code. Thank you very much. So we have our QR code here. And if not, feel free to check your emails. Uh, the ZBW team just sent out to everyone an email with a link to that as well. And if I heard correctly, I believe we have our first question for Anne already. If we can have that come up to the screen. I'll go ahead and read it. So our first question is, Open Sci is associated with OA, which is then exploited by the publishing industry using prestige masks. How can PLUS and other organizations remove this mask? Question mark. Please, Ian. We start off so with a critical question, but that's good for, for yeah, a debate. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that, that's fine. I yeah. think that you know, I'll, my understanding of the question is, is about prestige, about impact, um, and journals, the publishing industry's role in, role in, I suppose, facilitating that. And I think um, there are several things. I think part of the solution is offering publication venues such as PLOS One, which publish 
methodologically rigorous or sound research, regardless of its perceived impact or importance, to ensure that all research results um, that are rigorous can be shared and, and can be found and reused, importantly. I also think that um, publishers in particular, both signing up to, but implementing the principles of DORA, the Declaration on Research Assessment, which includes, for example, not using impact or journal-based metrics in how journals are promoted or talked about to different research communities. And I think the final thing I would say is really that initiatives like Open Science Indicators are important in that they help to provide um, more diverse and a more nuanced um, idea of the ways in which research um, can be shared, has been shared, and to help promote um, it, being re it being reused. Um, and I think that ultimately will help us to give us that broader, more diverse picture that will um, diminish the, the importance of the often convenient focus on, on impact. But I really think we need to give those involved in discovering research and assessing research better tools to do that. And I think giving them more information that's more nuanced and specific to particular projects is, is a certainly an important part of that solution. Okay, thank you. Yes, and again, since you're our first keynote, again, I'd like to remind everyone watching at home in their offices, um, if you want to ask us questions with the Slido, we have the QR code. I could point to it there, so go ahead and use that. And again, also, we had a small technical glitch with the URL, so uh, the ZBW team has sent out to everyone in their email folders. Just go to your inbox, and you should be able to have a link to that as well. Um, during your presentation, I actually jotted one or two notes down. My question, in. Um, what are some challenges or limitations associated with, with using the open science indicators tool? Yeah, so I think a key limitation, um, if, if, um, if viewers didn't catch that, is that we are analyzing all PLOS articles. So we publish around 20,000 or so a year. Um, and we're also analyzing a comparator group of non-PLOS articles, but that comparator group um, it, it comes from PubMed Central, the open access content in PubMed Central mm -hmm. is at the moment only about 10% of the size of the PLOS corpus. So it doesn't give you a comprehen fully comprehensive view um, of even all life sciences research. But um, you know, with these kinds of initiatives, um, we wanted to start early, wanted to share results early um, and get feedback to help us determine if we're doing the right thing or, or if we should change it. So I think the, the scope the content coverage is one limitation, which mm. we're very much aware of. And as I mentioned in the talk, um, we're, we're working to try and at least increase the size of that comparator cohort. So I think that's that that's one pro probably the main limitation. But that's also um, I think with this initiative, it's it's we don't see it as something that only PLOS could or should do. Um, and how different organizations might approach this kind of problem is, is, is very much up to them for what they're trying to achieve. But we wanted to show that this is possible. It is possible to understand these sorts of sharing practices at scale. Um, so we welcome more contributions to, to, to this problem. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, I see also from our audience, we have a question coming in through Slido, and I'll read that here. Does PLOS have plans to blend code slash anal an analysis with the articles, that is, executable research articles? So that's that's an interesting question. So um, I'm not sure I would say concretely we have plans, but this is actually an area that we've looked into. Um, mm. A couple of years ago, we did some prototyping. We did some user research, um, and we published the results of that research in the PeerJ um, last year. So we were curious about the potential um, for those more executable research articles. And we worked with um, a group in Canada um, who uh, have a platform called NeuroLibre, and we actually created interactive versions of, of some PLOS papers to try to understand whether or not offering that kind of uh, feature from PLOS would help more people share code. Because mm. as I mentioned, with about more open science practices. And what we discovered was that from a reader's perspective, uh, um, they they seem to prefer accessing code uh, simply via a web link, such as from GitHub or Zenodo or or another platform. Um, so in terms of our current goal of, of trying to promote code sharing, um, that th they didn't seem to be offering um, a better solution than other things that were out there. Mm. 
but that's not to say that there aren't features of those that, that could be really valuable in terms of, for example, having the data and the code in the same environment could be useful for people that really want to reuse research. Um, but I also think it's important that as PLOS, it's not necessary for us to build and create all of the solutions on our own platform. We very much mm -hmm. often partner with more specialist resources to try and achieve these things. Um, and the way that we work with various preprint servers, for example, is, is, is another example of that. Mm, fascinating, okay. Great, I see that we have time for one more question. And again, our audience members have sent us in. Thank you very much for the good questions. Let me if I see it right here. Meta research shows that around half of deposited data is not usable. Um, how this can be captured by open, or how can this be uh, captured by open data indicators? What PLOS is doing? What is PLOS doing to address this? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, buried within that white paper I cited about our principles and requirements, there's a, mm. we, we set out um, a more aspirational framework for uh, open science indicators. So if anyone's familiar with the FAIR acronym, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, at the moment, open science indicators are essentially measuring, is it findable, is it accessible? Mm -hmm. But we absolutely would like to move towards measuring interoperability and reusability in, in a more automated way. So right now, you can determine if things are in a particular repository, but we're not offering any judgment or assessment of quality. But we have begun to think about and conceptualize what doing that might look like, um, but we haven't yet implemented it. But there are others actually that are doing exciting work in this area. There's a tool called Fuji, um, which I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but they have begun to automate their assessment of data deposited in repositories. And I'm really excited by that kind of work and would love to think about what that would mean to integrate that kind of assessment into open science indicators in the future. Super. Thank you very much. Thank you for a fantastic presentation. Thank you also for the first round of Q&A, questions and answers. Again, could you tell me your last name? I, with great respect, it is pronounced? Hernastevich. Hernastevich, very good. Ian Hernastevich from PLOS, thank you very much. We give you a digital round of applause. Thank and you. I think with that, we say goodbye. Enjoy the rest of the uh, Open Science Conference, of course. And then it's time to move over to our second keynote speaker.